Amen. Thank you, choir. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 John, 1 John chapter number 4, and I want to talk to you today about, about love. We throw that word around so easily sometimes, you know, but I want us to look at it in a different light today from, from God's word, you know. Things change oftentimes when through the years, couples that once before while we was there, you know, loving each other and all that, sometimes you get, uh, you kind of get away, you take people for granted. Victor was just telling me, matter of fact, this morning that used to, when he came home six years ago, when they first got married, he would come home and, and Katrina would have his shoes there, his waiting for him and his dog would be barking around. He said now six years later he goes in, his dog brings the shoes and she's out barking around. So, you know, things can sure change in six years, can't they? No. All right, First John chapter 4, I want to talk to you about a theme that uh, John talks about often in the Bible. Paul writes about it as well, and, and that is that, that we serve a, a God of love. We do serve a God that can can put broken pieces back together. We serve a God who can fix uh, anything, whatever might be going on uh, in our life. You know, as I read about Paul in the Bible, and I read about John as well. I love, I love both of them's writings. It seems like they were overwhelmed by this thing about love uh, as, they, as they write about it. You know, it's, uh, they, they start out with, uh, with his uh, theology about about what love means about the God of, that we serve, the God that's a God of love. And uh, I heard once there was a, a great theologian who was at a, at a, at a place where a lot of people there and a lot of preachers were there and others. And, and so they asked him, they said, you know, you're a great theologian. Would you just come and, and tell, in just a few moments, tell us about uh, love. What does love really mean? And he walked up to the podium, and these were his words. He says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he sat down. You know what? He's right on it, wasn't he? That's exactly right. And we're going to talk about that day, today. So I'm going to talk about two men today, rather than just talking about John from 1 John. I want to talk about Paul as well. Because Paul was such a, such a great man of God. Both of them were sold out to God. It's very obvious as we read, the, as we read their, their books. So today this message is about us understanding a, about God's love for us. God just loves us. Now it's hard to explain that love. You can't explain what love is actually. But we can experience that love. We can experience God's love in our life. And so... Paul is telling the church at Corinth, that church there was having some difficulty, that church there was having problems from within. Uh, there were a lot of people complaining. They didn't like the way the church was being operated. They didn't like some of the things the church was doing, you know, and, and so it was damaging the church. Uh, complainers can do that. If you have someone who's a complainer about everything, it, it does damage to the kingdom's work. It does damage to, uh, to the church as well. So this was what was de- that Paul was dealing with uh, as he dealt with the, at the church there in Corinth. And so what mattered most to him was, and his Christianity and the life was, was love, the love of God and also the church. So in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul is telling God's people all this conflict they're going through. Paul says, let all your things be done with love. So it's not surprising as Paul ends his letter in 1 Corinthians how that he goes back to this topic of love. And so he says, let all things be done in love. Whatever you're doing, you need to do it in love. And so had the church at Corinth or any church, if they would spend as much time praying as they did complaining, then we couldn't imagine what an influence that would make on this world that we live in today. You see, the church doesn't have much influence now on the world that we live in. Sadly, that's the way it is, and we, we have got to change that. We need to, be a, uh, we need to make an influence in this world. Sadly, many churches have let the world change them instead of, 
instead of the church changing the world, the, the world has changed the church. So what does Paul mean when he says this to the church at Corinth, when he says, do everything in love? What did he mean by that? He meant, do everything in love. He couldn't make it any more clear than that. And that's what I want to share with you today about love from 1 John. But also I want to, I want to share with you from Paul in Corinthians as well about doing everything in love. That's the realm in which you and I should do things. We should do it in love, do it in God's love. It'll make a difference in your life. It'll make a difference in your home life, in your family's life. It'll make a difference in your church life. And let me tell you, it will make a difference in the community that you and I live in as well. It just works. So let's look, if you would, at 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. Back up to chapter 1, then we'll jump to verse 4. And I'm just going to launch off from here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. Here's what he tells us that we can experience. He said, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, the life was made visible, your Bible might say, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and which was manifested unto us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you now for your written word that, that we could open together and, and just see what you would have to say to us today. Father, as we, as we read our Bibles, we'll see that all through our Bible, it just tells us about your love that you have for us. Even though we were so unlovely, but yet you were willing to give your life for us. And so, Father, I pray as we look at these verses today about love, that we'll know where we stand with you, that we will, we will know that, that we are a born-again child of God. Our name is written down in heaven, that our name is in the Lamb's book of life. And Father, you made that possible for us, and for that, we're grateful. I pray this in Christ's name, amen. Someone had made a comment about love, and love is a, it is a truth in action. That's what love is. It's something that, that, that we, it's an act. It's something that, that we do. It's a, a willful decision. Uh, we will our lives, we will ourselves to do these things. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus himself gave us those words. So 1 John here that we're going to look at for a few moments is a wonderful book that tells us about God's love. 1 John 1, verse 4, he writes this, that our joy might be full. And that word full there means that, that we can be filled to the very brim is what he is talking about there. Now, people who are lost, people who do not know Jesus, they, they may have the pleasures in life, but they don't know this love here that you and I no, because of Jesus Christ. First John 2, verse 1, he writes to us that we might not sin. In other words, we have an advocate with a father. We have a, a Savior who paid our sin debt that we owe. First John 5, 13, he says that we might know that we have eternal life. I hear people often say sometimes, we, we ask them the question, do you know the Lord or do you know you're saved? And they say, well, I hope so or I, I think so. Friend, we have a no-so salvation. We can know without a doubt that we are a born-again child of God when we confess our sins, tell God we're sorry for our sin, realize where we are, that we're without Him, and invite Him to come and live into our heart. The Bible tells us that when we do that, then we can know without a doubt that we can have eternal life. 1 John 4.11, John writes, we ought also to love one another. So John's great book is about love. All through the book, you'll read it. As a matter of fact, there's 46 times the word love shows up in 135 verses in, in 1 John. Now, he was, uh, he was uh, combating the, the Gnosticism that was going on in his day, and actually Paul was doing the same thing. In other words, there were a lot of false teachers out there. There were people out there who were having people follow them instead of following the Lord. 
you know, any time that I'll be up here to preach or Victor will be up here to preach, you know what we want to do? We want to get out of the way and lift up Jesus. That's what we want to do. Because when we lift up Jesus, people are drawn unto him. So this is a great book uh, that we're looking back at. And John is writing this, and he's telling us about love. Now, in the process of him writing this letter to those people that day, and he's writing to us today as well, that there is a great love out there that we should have for others. There are people out there who are lost without Jesus, and we need to love those people to the Lord. Now, 1 John 4, 7, here's a clear statement. He says, for love is of God. So God is our source of love. That's where it all begins. It all begins with God. And he loved us enough that he was willing to sacrifice his son to go to the cross for us. And so Jesus is an example of what it really means to love. This is what he is sharing with us. You know, everything that Jesus did in his life and his death as well, when he was here upon this earth, everything he did was extreme love. He loved us so much. Romans 8 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's hard for us to understand all that, but here's one thing. We can experience that love, the promise that he'll never leave us. Now look at verse number 7, 1 John 4. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to love. He said, Beloved, let us love one another. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. The Bible says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So God's love is eternal is what he is telling us. It is eternal. It's forever. And you know what? He desires the best for you and me. I read a little thing about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln... Uh, uh, had a, an outspoken uh, critic, uh, political enemy, who he was. His name was Edwin uh, Stratton. And Edwin Stratton made fun of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he said he was shallow. He wasn't capable of holding any kind of political office. And he said he even looks like a, an ape. He said, I don't know why people want to go to Africa to see an ape when they have one down there in Springfield, uh, Illinois. Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln never responded to those remarks that his political enemy made about him. But when Abraham Lincoln was elected, select, elected president of the United States, do you know whom he made as his, his uh, secretary of war? He made that gentleman right there who made all those comments about him. And so his friend says, why did you get him? You know what he, is, what he has said about you. And he says, because he is the best for the position. Later on, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, uh, it, it, history tells us that this man, Stratton, stood next to his coffin and wept and wept and wept. And he said, there's never been a man like this who loved like this. So you see, love wins out. Sometimes we have to be more patient with people but love will win out. Sometimes we have to be more lovable, but love will always win out. And so we need to hang in there. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So we're to, we're to love others. We're to love other people, even when they're unlovely, even when they say things that, that we don't like, and even when they're not for things we're for that we're for, we still must respect them. But you know, that don't necessarily mean we have to like them, you know. We have to love them, but we don't have to like them and to be their friend, to, to, you know, be around them, but we must love those people. Look at verse number 9, 1 John 4, 9. He said, Then this was made manifested, or your Bible might say made visible, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. So God's love is based on his grace. He proved his love to us. God sent his son down from heaven. You know, that still just amazes me. And I was sharing in a Sunday school class this morning. There was a man that made an impression upon my life 60 years ago, and I still think about him this day. His name was Roy Wyrick. 
Some of you in this room would probably know, have known Roy Wark in days gone by. He was my Sunday school teacher when I was in the sixth grade. And Roy Wark would begin reading about what Jesus Christ had done on Calvary's cross because of his love for us. And he would weep while he would read it. And I, us boys would sit there in the class and what a, what a tremendous lesson he was teaching us, you know, of compassion and love. And he would get very emotional every time that he read that. So God's love is based upon his grace. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. It comes from the very heart of God. And we ought to thank him every day for his grace, and we ought to thank him every day for his love. 1 John 4, 19, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So, you know, his love is supernatural. He loves us with a, with a supernatural love. It's a, it's a sacrificial love. He was willing to give his life. That's how much that he loved us. Look at verse 10. It was demonstrated at Calvary. He said, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So where did love really begin? It didn't begin with us, did it? It began with God. He first, he says there, he first loved us. Jesus stood in the gap for us is what he did. The Bible tells us, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean? That means that Jesus Christ took your place on that cross in my place. That's what we deserve. There's not a person in this building today. There's not a loved one of ours who've gone on to glory to be with the Lord who deserved to be in heaven. But because of God's grace, because of God's love, he made that possible. If Jesus were to come back today, would you be ready for him? Or if your life were to be over today, would you be ready for heaven for all eternity? There's so many people that their families are going to be there, their children perhaps be there, and there's going to be a mom and a dad perhaps who will miss heaven. Just by a few inches, they believed in their head that there was a God, but you see, we believe in our heart. That's the love. We, we express that love through our heart. He made his love visible to us, and, and we're, to, we're to love him back. He took our place. First Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but he says, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So his death released. It released that redemption for you and me and made it possible that we could come to the cross and ask for forgiveness. And you know what happens when we do that? His spirit comes in our spirit. Do you know today, without a doubt, is he in your heart today? Is he in your life today? Has there been that time that you've invited Christ to, to come in and, and, and forgive your sin, bring salvation into your life? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. It's because of his love that he extends that grace to you and me. Colossians says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Revelation 1.5, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what he was doing on that cross. He was there in our place on that cross. Verse 11, 1 John 4 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If we possess that love, it's to be made visible in our life. We are to love others. You know, I think about illustrations of men in the Bible. And I shared, matter of fact, just the other night, I shared about Joseph. Joseph is, is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. You talk about someone who displayed that love, and that's what we're to do. We're to display this love in our life. If Christ is in us, we're to display that. We need to be careful what we say. We need to be careful how we act. We need to love other people. And, and when they get angry at us, we, we just need to forgive them. And we, we need to, is there anybody that you need to forgive? Maybe there's someone that you're ill at, that you're bothered with. Maybe you need to forgive them before you can experience God's love like he wants you to experience that love. That's what he wants us to do. But you know, you think about Joseph of all people. Joseph's brothers were jealous of him. They put him down in a hole in the ground and the older brother talked them into selling them then to these traders 
who were going down to Egypt. They were going down there to the slave market. And so they, they, they sold Joseph, sold their brother, because they hated their brother. He had that coat of many colors, and they were jealous of him. And so he goes down there. Later on, he's bought by Potiphar, and then he is accused of something he wasn't guilty of, of making advances to uh, Potiphar's wife, thrown in jail at 18 years of age, stayed in jail probably 12 years till he was 30 years old, Never one time did Joseph ever say, why me? Why is this happening to me? He just kept on trusting God. And so the story goes then that later on, he became second in command of the whole thing. He was over all the food distribution. And, and his mom, he, or his dad, he didn't even know if his dad was living. And so it's a beautiful story from Genesis 35 to Genesis 50. Read it this afternoon. Because how, how pretty it is. And so the long story short, he loved his brother so much, even though they had wronged him, they had done this, that he forgave his brothers. Here's what he said in Genesis 45. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God sent me before you to preserve life. Friend, let me tell you, that is forgiving love is what that is. Forgiving grace, that's exactly what was extended. You know, you think about Peter in the Bible. Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ, stood there in a fire there. And a girl said, aren't you with that guy? Didn't you come in here with him? He said, I don't even know him. We know the story about the cock crowing, but he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. But then later on, he begged Christ for forgiveness. And you know what Jesus says? It's people like Peter, upon this rock I shall build my church. Forgiveness, that's God's forgiveness and his love that extended to him. Think about David in the Bible. David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. David committed the sin of the world out there and, and took another man's wife. Had Uriah, her husband, killed so he could take her and cover up because now she was with child. He did all those things. And, and then we read Psalm 51. He said, cleanse my heart, O God. Wash me thoroughly. Forgive me of all my iniquity. He wrote a psalm. He said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities and heals all thy diseases. You see, he was so grateful to get forgiveness. He committed all the sins of the world, but yet Christ's love was extended to him. Psalm 103, David said, Who redeemeth my life from destruction, who crowneth me with loving kindness and tender mercies. That's the God that we serve, the God who can put marriages back together. He can fix things that in life, that obstacles in life when we come to these things in life. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if we really love him, you say you love him, are you keeping his commandments? Hebrews chapter 10 says that we are to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There'll be a love for the church. Do you love the church? Do you love the things, the activities of the church, having your family involved? David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So we're to love others as well. We're to love the church. We're to gather here. We come here for a purpose today, and that's to worship and to praise God. That's why we're here today. And that should That should be pleasing to him when we come together and to praise him. 1 John 4.20, we'll have love for the saints. If a man says, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath, hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this is a commandment that we have heard from the beginning, that he who loveth God loves his brother also. When we walk in love, then God will be seen. We're to love others even when people are unlovely. So we ought to praise the Lord today for his overwhelming love for us. He just loves us. Oliver Cromwell shares this true story from days gone by. Over in England, there was a young soldier who'd been tried by the military court, and he was sentenced to death. He was to die by hanging 
at the ringing of the curfew bell that evening. His fiance found out what the verdict was, that he was going to be put to death as soon as the bell was rung that evening for curfew, that she literally climbed up into that bell tower. She wrapped her clothing around that bell tower and herself so when the bell tower went to ring that there would be no ring there. And so when it came time for curfew, then Oliver Cromwell said, where is, where is the bell? Why didn't the bell sound? And so some of his men climbed up into the bell tower and found this lady bleeding profusely. She was cut all over and where she was banged against the side of that bell. They brought her down, brought her before him. And he was so impressed with her love that she had for a fiancé that Cromwell said, there'll be no curfew tonight. He was so impressed by that love. And people ought to be impressed for the love that we have for the Lord, folks. Our churches, sadly today, most churches are not making an impression on this world that we live in because we act more like the world. We go to the world's places. We go to the movies and some of these things that, that the world goes to. You know, that's hypocrisy, folks, because our love is a failure when we do that. So how much do you love the Lord? Do you love him enough to, to let to do what he calls you to do in life, to live, to live for him, to serve him? I heard about a young man that was saved. He got saved in the church one Sunday. And he was in his early 20s, and, and uh, he had no education. He had, uh, had to quit school in the eighth grade to go to work on the farm and in order for the family to make it. And, but he was going to church, and, and he got saved. He just fell in love with Jesus, and he wanted to tell everybody. And he had a high school friend that he had gone to high school with, and this high school friend had gone on to be an attorney there in that town. And, and so this young man goes to his office, and and he says, I, I, I know the attorney well, the secretary, and I'd like to talk to him just for a few minutes. And so she goes back and tells him this man is out there whom he knew. And, and so the young guy goes back there. He was scared to death because here he is a lawyer. And here he was, just a common, no education guy uh, to speak of in life. And, and so he shared Jesus with this guy, with his attorney. And every argument that he would have about Jesus, this attorney would have an argument and use brilliant words this young man that he didn't understand. And, and so he didn't get anywhere with him and he felt like he was a failure and he felt ashamed now that he'd even come because he had no reply for this attorney. And so as he was walking out the door, he turned back around. He said, I just came today because I love you. And he went out the door. He went home and told his wife, he said, I, I'm just a failure. He said, I, I don't want to see anybody else the rest of the day, honey. He said, I want, to, I want to go to my room and I want to get my Bible and pray. And he said, I feel like I let God down and I, I, I couldn't bring up stuff to the, to the attorney. I was trying to, to tell him how much Jesus loved him. And, and he said, I, I just want to be alone the rest of the day. And she understood. He went to his room. About an hour later, there was a knock on the door. And the lady went to the door, and there was this attorney there at the door. And she asked if she could help him, and he said, yes. He said, and called the guy by name, said, I'm here to see him. And she said, well, he's having kind of a rough time right now, and, and he just asked that he be alone uh, for the rest of the day. And she said, the attorney said, well, would you go tell him my name and see if that makes a difference? And she went back, and she called the attorney by name to her husband, and he said, yes, let him come in. So he came in and came back into his room, and he said, well, he said, are you here to argue about religion or some of the things I had to say? He said, no, I want you to tell me how to be saved. He said, I want to know about this love that somebody loved me enough that he went to the cross and died in my place. I want you to tell me how to be saved. And so the young man looked at him astonished. He says, you know, why did you come here? Why, why do you have that question now? And he said, all because of one thing you said. He said, when you walked out that door, you said, I love you. 
So you see, love works. It just works. Now, I know people say things to us sometimes to upset us, and people complain, just like in Paul's day. There, People complained then, and I guess they complain today. But we, of all people, because of the love of God he has for us and given his son for us, you talk about a people that ought to be positive about things, a people that ought to, ought to be vocal about what Christ has done for us and what Christ is doing in our life now. When we do that, we will make a difference on the world that we live in, on the community that we live in, and make a difference in our home. Let's bow our heads together for a moment. We're going to have a moment of invitation. Christ went to the cross for us. He manifested, made visible that love that he had for us. The righteous judgment that belonged to us was death, was the cross. But Jesus Christ was willing to tie himself to that cross, to be nailed to that cross and die for us. And his cry was the curfew will not ring tonight. He was saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. So now when we look at the cross, our decision is since he has established a loving relationship, the thing is, will we accept his invitation? He extends an invitation to you to come and know him in a personal way. God gave his life for you. If you don't know Christ today, then you must take that first step before you can ever hope to love like God. We must be saved by him first. Have you taken that first step? That's a step of faith. When we step out on faith and say, Jesus, I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you died for my sins. Father, please forgive me. That first step is a step of faith. Have you made that step? Have you come to him? Have you accepted what he did for you at Calvary's cross to be sufficient? How's your love this morning? Are you in love with him? Is your love fresh for him? Are you excited about what God is doing what he's done in your life and what he's doing now? Are you allowing him to work through your life? Have you responded to God's love? It's a yes. It's to say yes for him. He always called openly and publicly. Will not to be ashamed to take a stand for him invite you to come today to a loving Savior. Father, I pray for these moments of invitation. I just pray that your will will be done. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to have a moment of invitation. If you've never received Christ, if you've never asked for that forgiveness, won't you do it today? Get it settled and sealed today and know that your name is written down in heaven, that you're heaven bound for all eternity. He'll walk with you every day, never leave you nor forsake you. Don't depend on anything else except the cross to get you to heaven. So many today are depending on the morality. They're a good person, you know, we do these things. It's all about one thing, about Jesus Christ going to the cross and paying that debt for us. Maybe you're looking for a church home and you feel this is where God is leading you to be a part of a local congregation. Or maybe you need to come for a word of prayer today just to recommit your life anew to the Lord. This is God's invitation. I'll be here at the front. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing, you come. Oh, to Jesus, I
come today? Has God spoken to you? Sir, young person, man. just for a moment. I'm not going to drag the invitation out, but I would hate to close an invitation if someone was just a moment away from making a decision, maybe an eternal, lifelong decision. That's what it is when we receive Christ. So where are you in your relationship with Him? Do you know Him in your heart? Folks, that's all that matters in this life and the life to come is what we do with Jesus. Do you know that love? You see, if you never receive that love and go through this life, then what Christ did on the cross was a waste for you. But He loved you so much. Even before the foundation of this earth, He loved us. It didn't begin there in His incarnation. It began in heaven. God sent His Son, His plan. He knew that you and I would need a Savior. And He sent His boy down here to be our Savior. Won't you say yes to him today? Maybe you're looking for a church home. I invite you to come today and be a part of a, of a Bible-believing church. We love the Lord and we love each other. And we're excited about the days ahead of what God's going to do here. And we would love to have you to be in on all those things as we, as we reach out in this community with the gospel message. And that message is that we have a God of love we serve. this way. Thank you for being here this morning. It's my joy to share today these two coming from a sister church, Bardstown, Kentucky. They've been up there. Victor and Katrina, he'll be my co-pastor or our co-pastor here. We're going to work together. He'll also be the minister of education, uh, an area that we certainly need a lot of help in, and he's qualified for all that. Victor's a seminary graduate out of Louisville, Kentucky. He grew up here in Corbin. Um, and Philip Bramlett and Vicki Bramlett, few people through the years have known them. Uh, and Cretina is from Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, so they come now. God is, they prayed about this. And Victor and I have been praying about it for a long time. And, uh, and he wasn't ready before because he felt like his work wasn't finished there. And then one day we were talking and he felt like that what he was sent there to do, that he'd accomplish. So we need to pray for that church that they'll carry what he and Katrina started there, that uh, someone will come in and carry that on, and then look forward to what, uh, uh, what, how God's going to use them there in this church. So if you rejoice with Victor and Katrina Bramlett coming to be a part of Poplar Grove Baptist Church, and on staff at Poplar Grove Baptist Church, would you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. All right. That means we're going to love you and look forward to the days ahead. Now, you'll want to come by. Uh, most of you in here know this couple already from previous years, uh, but if you don't, you need to come by and introduce yourself and, uh, and uh, welcome them both into the, the Poplar Grove Church. They moved up off the London Highway, uh, not too far from here, so they're close and they're settled in there already, and that's good, or they're settling in there, I guess that takes a while. Yeah, that takes a good while, but uh, he's a dog lover, I can tell you that. I don't know about cats. You don't like cats, do you? I got two oh, of them, Lord. too. I see I got my work cut out for me. I think. <laughs> so a lot of you all are dog lovers. All right, so you come by and welcome them to church. Thank you for being here this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, we're so glad you've come to be a part of our time together. Now, we're going to adjourn until tonight at 6 o'clock, so we look forward to seeing you tonight. All right, Chad, lead us as we go. Blessed be.